Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace. Is it possible to seek justice when it's based on a lie? Isn't the lie itself a perversion of justice? Black Lives Matter and the 1619 Project have been rewriting history in a way that challenges their credulity. The story of the Tulsa riot in 1921 is a case in point. Mr. Eddie Huff, an entrepreneur, missionary, radio personality, author, and longtime resident of Tulsa, Oklahoma, discusses the riot and much more when we return. Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace, and it's my pleasure to have my good friend, Mr. Eddie Huff, with us today. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, Dr. Wallace. Good, good. You know this is a Christian program, and, and, one, and not everyone who comes on is, is a believer. So every now and then we like to have those who come on who are believers uh, share a little bit of their testimony. So if, if you would, you mind telling us a little bit how you came to Christ? Yeah, um, yeah, boy, that's, it could be a show on its own. But anyway, I was born, <laughs> <laughs> I was born as a war baby. I, I'm half German, and I was born in Germany in a little village outside Nuremberg. Uh, my mom and dad. He's from Mississippi. She's a German peasant girl. Anyway, uh, I was born. They couldn't get married for five years. Finally got married. Uh, I moved straight from the German little village to the project in Philadelphia. So I grew up in the hood in Philly, then moved to an Air Force base in New Mexico. So I, I was all over, just to make a long story short, I was all over the place and went to Texas Tech University. And about a month after graduation, I kept running into this little black hippie. There's a little black hippie guy, and every time he walked in, you remember Sambo's residence? They used to call it Sambo's. Yeah, and it's right, big right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we used to go there every Friday night, be high, and uh, this little guy would come in, and he had a little dope pouch, but instead of dope, he had a Bible in it. And he started witnessing, and my friends all hated to be around him. They would take off as soon as he came, scattering like roaches. But anyway, he... Uh, I was drawn to the guy and he led me to the Lord. That was June 8th, 1973 and totally flipped my world around. I was a black radical, worked on the McGovern campaign, Democrat, the whole nine yards, hippie, you know, Black Panther wannabe. And in an instant, uh, God just changed my whole life, uh, delivered me from any type of desire for drugs or any of the stuff I was into. So anyway, that's my uh, little short, brief testimony. I've been a missionary, uh, worked in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I still do work in Uganda and South Africa back during apartheid, uh, North and Morocco, Egypt, different places like that, all over Europe. So that's. Uh, you have some seminary background as well. Yeah, I went to Melody Land School of Theology. It was uh, it was at that time the only charismatic. Uh, seminary out there, <laughs> a part of Melody Land Christian Center, which at that time was the largest charismatic church in America. Okay, it's located in Anaheim, across from Disneyland. Yeah, we want to talk about the Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the the riot slash massacre, whose 100th anniversary was uh, June in June uh, 2021. Uh, you've lived there, uh, from I understand, at least 30 years, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know some of the survivors, and you were there when they were doing the filming. What do you think of the recent portrayals uh, of the incident? Yeah, it's revisionist history. Uh, the, the initial reports and the initial TV coverage or, or documentaries were pretty fair. In fact, uh, you even told me about the one on Discovery Channel that I watched and I thought it was pretty fair. It never should have happened, okay? Uh, let me just say that from the outset. It was an awful, right. horrible, tragedy okay people were hurt and everything but what what's missing is the revival of greenwood and but people want to erase that uh they've now tried to make it mandatory saying they're making it mandatory to be taught in schools what's well, been taught in the schools in oklahoma since 1973 but it, just because people didn't yeah just because people skipped over that or they were, weren't paying attention doesn't mean right, they right. Talk, right? I mean, that's what... <laughs> you would never get that from the, the recent documentary. They don't even mention that as being taught. They act as though it's not being taught at all. 
Exactly. Wow. And it's been okay. in the curriculum since 1973. In any event, it's, it's one of these, like I said, a tragedy. No one knows exactly what happened as far as on the elevator, right, with the young right. lady who ended up in the arms of this black elevator operator. And, and the other thing about it that is so tragic to me that they're not mentioning is the fact that the sheriff's department did everything they could to protect this young man. They shut the elevators down. They uh, armed, put armed guards on every floor up the stairwell in case lynchers were to, to show up and try to lynch the young man. So they had him protected. Of course, there was not a lot of trust in the black community. So certain people got weapons, young young men, and headed and pickup truck down to the uh, to the courthouse. They were going to protect this, you know, keep him from being mm -hmm. lynched. And of course, then the word got out that bleeps are coming with guns. Uh, it reminds me of the Eddie Murphy, 48 hours, you know, most dangerous thing in the world. <laughs> it's one of us with a gun. Right. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and so that was the word that went out. Tulsa was segregated, it was a weird time. And of course, then the mob gathered and so forth. So there were, there were mistakes made on, both sides. The one in the black community, there was no trust of law enforcement, no trust that this young man would be protected. And then, of course, in the white community, an overreaction to some black man coming with weapons to defend the young man. And right. one thing led to another, shots were fired, and we have a devastated community. Now, the other thing that is missing, which I feel is even a bigger tragedy, is the fact that Greenwood became more prosperous after the riot or massacre, if you will. Right. Uh, right. It became more prosperous after than it was even before. And that is discussed how the business community in North Tulsa got together and they did it themselves. They didn't wait for the government to kick in. They didn't wait for anybody to come do this. They did it. They rebuilt it. Let's put a let's 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 put a let's put a pin in that one for a second. Okay. Because yeah, sure. Before we go before we go to that, I want to ask you something about um, it was also called Black Wall Street, um, the the Greenwood district, uh, and I, I from what I understand is that that was a name given to it by one of your heroes, <laughs> Booker T. Washington. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he had spoken in Muskogee, Muskogee, Oklahoma, which mm -hmm. is about. Oh, 30, 40 miles south of here. And they used to have the National Negro Business League, which he started. And they would have these conventions around the country. And he mentioned Tulsa as the Black Wall Street because so much business was being done there. And they were doing so well, that Greenwood District. Uh -huh. And the, um, the National Negro Business League, that convention had thousands of successful Black people. That's another thing that we could get in maybe another time, the black, wealthy black townships in Oklahoma. There were millionaires, there were black millionaires. Uh, a book I'll recommend is The Black Man in Business by Booker T. Washington. It's hard to find, it's gonna cost you a lot of money because it's a rare book. But it talks about these millionaires coming in Kansas, the Potato King uh, of Topeka, Kansas, uh, uh -huh. in, in New York City and all that. So anyway, I just wanna say, Black people were very affluent. They were doing well. And the narrative that North Tulsa or Black communities today are languishing because of the riot, that's just a big cop out. That's just some people trying to, you know, the typical, typical race doctors, race pimps. So what is the agenda then behind not talking about the, um, the rebuilding or the resurrection of not only Tulsa or Black, black Wall Street, but not even talking about any of the, the black towns you were just talking, you just mentioning, that sprung up across the country, well, in Oklahoma specifically, and in other places across the country where blacks were actually doing well. Uh, what's, what's the agenda behind that, do you think? The agenda would be that we're headed towards socialism. And if, if we can, if we were to tell people that we could do it without the government, that just lets the air out of that bubble, right? In right. other words, that black people are smart enough, not only smart enough to register and vote, right, but right. smart enough to build and rebuild the most successful 
area of town in the nation. So if we could do that on our own, and that word gets out, uh oh, the, the, these people, you know, AOC and and all of these, uh, the squad and, and, and the girls <laughs> right. on the View, they're in trouble. You know, we don't need y'all anymore. We can do this ourselves. That's what the that's the whole reason behind. It. So I guess they can't paint a picture of black people being victims even after a riot or slash massacre, as they want to call it, um, gets destroyed. And I'm, I'm with you. It's a terrible tragedy. It really is, but we should learn from it. And my feeling is we can't learn from it unless we're willing to tell the truth about it. Exactly. So once we tell the truth about it, then we can look back and see you know, what the real narrative is, not what the false one is. It's interesting and, you say that too, Eric, because there's uh, another project my son is working on. It's Greenwood Rising, and they're building uh, a monument or a museum to the riot or the whatever you want to call it. And, and the aftermath, but it tells the story how Greenwood rose again to prominence. It was it, in the in the fifties. It was a hopping place. They had their own pharmacies. They had their own drugstore. Uh, well, drug store well, pharmacy. They had their own grocery stores. They had everything. Now they have nothing up there. And it, and it's and it was integration that basically did. I'm not against integration or anything, but you know. When, when the people could buy things at the white store, then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you know, they flocked there and it killed. I had a good friend, he just passed away a couple of years ago. And his family owned the drugstore in North Tulsa for years. And he went and studied pharmacy himself, became a pharmacist. They were doing great, but they had to close down. He ended up going to work for Walgreens and, and, and the white pharmacies because they couldn't, the people, for some reason, the white man's medicine was better. It worked better. Same, same ingredients, but the white man's worked better. There's no way you can ask for justice or build justice on a lie. There was a lie that the, um, the gentleman in the uh, elevator had done something to this, this, this white girl who was the elevator operator. I mean, like you said, we really don't know what happened, but the fact that she doesn't press charges against him makes you think that nothing really happened. Uh, and that and he the eventually... Sheriff, they, they moved his sheriff personally delivered him, took him to Kansas out of the... Yeah, really, okay. So he, he left town uh, and went on with his life. The only, there was maybe only one or two buildings that didn't get rebuilt. Everything else was rebuilt. And from what I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that, that the new Wall Street was even better than the old one. The only thing that it actually stopped it was uh, urban renewal and integration. Is that correct? Yeah, they, later they built a freeway right through it. Uh, yeah. And the, the other thing is the, the, the black citizens, the, the business leaders in North Tulsa, not the pastors, the business leaders. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the, the, the business leaders got together and they were trying, the state was trying to pass a law or make it so they could purchase all that land from Green. Right. They wanted right. to be able to buy it or basically steal it. <laughs> right, basically, yeah. That, that's a tragedy that nobody talks about. I mean, that's that's a bigger thing. That's worse than to me whatever was happened before. Mm -hmm. But these business people got together, were smart, hired an attorney, a black attorney, who took the case, and a judge found in favor of the citizens of Green, the citizens of North Tulsa, found in their favor in segregationist Tulsa, Oklahoma, yeah. in the 1920s. Isn't that amazing? Those are, the, those are things that give me goosebumps, okay? When Absolutely. When our people fighting, rising up, fighting, standing, and winning, that's what, nobody's trying to say there wasn't segregation. Nobody's trying to say there wasn't slavery, that it wasn't. It wasn't, it wasn't racism. Right, right, right. You can't keep a good man or a good community. Absolutely. And I, and I look at this, the story of, of uh, Black Wall Street, I look at them as heroes, not victims. They're exactly. victors. They're victors. They were able to, um, they were resilient and they came back and they rebuilt. And that's, you know, and actually that's, that's one of the ways to thumb their nose at the, uh, <laughs> at, at the white racists that had tried to destroy them. They said, look, you did this, uh, you know, you tried to keep us down, but we're not going to stay down. Um, it doesn't matter what you do, we're going to continue to rise. Okay, so, so it's, it's, it's an amazing story and a story I think that needs to be told. But as I said, the truth needs to be told. Not this half truth where BL, BLM and you know critical race theory and and uh, the 1619 project want to distort our history in order you know uh, one of the things we did talk about 
on the phone, we talked about possibly doing this um, interview, um, was about reparations. Now, how does that fit in with this whole story? Oh, yeah. Okay. In 2002, the late Johnny Cochran of OJ fame, mm -hmm. Johnny Cro uh, Cochran and uh, Dr. Ogletree from Harvard came into town with some others, and they wanted to seek reparations for the right, the victim. Mm -hmm. And the state legislature made certain concessions. They, you know, did educational grants. They did uh, built a monument, uh, a park, and things like that. They, they did different things that they like, but they did not agree to reparations. And uh, Professor Ogletree made the statement that Tulsa is the linchpin in the entire national reparations movement. He's, uh, Tulsa is the linchpin in the reparations movement because if they can get the statute of limitation lifted for that riot, then, as they, my coach you said, Katie barred the door. They can ask for reparations for slavery. And that's why this is so important. And that's why they won't give up. They won't give up. Now, I don't believe, and actually they took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, nope, statute limitations stand. Well, I think what they're trying to do now, hoping, is that they can get a new, more favorable Supreme Court. And that's why they keep bringing this up. They had to go from riot to massacre. And my, my oh, suspicion. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. And you know why I think they did that too? It's, it's the, the word, you know, words mean things, right? So they when are, I say riot, who, who do you first, what's the first thing you think of? Black people, right? Black people, right? right. Looting, burning, you know. Well, truth be told, more white people rioted here in New York, you know, gangs of New York. You remember that movie, Gangs of New York? Right, right, right. White people, they go crazy when they riot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. They don't just loot and burn their own stuff. They go after the other. That's the difference between a black riot and a white riot. White people don't burn their own stuff. We burn right. our own stuff. All know? right, right. So anyway, but but uh, in people's minds, when you hear a massacre, that means these poor people, these victims got massacred. When you say riot, then they think, oh, black people must have rioted and the white people were just protecting themselves. So again, all of that is is to mess with people's psyche, just to get our minds in favor of these victims that we um, are, are trying to portray. And so that's why this is so important and people have to be aware of what's going on. It's not just about Tulsa. This is a national plan for national reparations. And the only people that are going to make money out of it are the lawyers and a certain, you know, same group here in town. Every time you hear, the black community for something or against something, it's always the same people with their hand out. They always get, you know, a million dollar for this project, a million dollar for this project, a million dollar. And, and if you ever hear them complain, it's because they've been cut out of it. Right. And, and uh, you know, I know names, okay? I, I can be, yeah. but it, they wouldn't mean anything well, to you, and I wouldn't mention them anyway. But it's always the same people, just like nationally, we always have the same people. Look, Eddie, with our, with our you know, last minute, uh, I've, I've got a question for you. I know you've you have a book coming out soon. I know you're supposed to be doing a podcast. You want to tell people about, uh, you know, what you're doing uh, with, yeah, the with those book, two? I've been working on it for about 30 years. Uh, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's and, and I think the time is right. It's about to come out probably in next month. It's called Y'all Have Sinned. Okay. And, and it, 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 the biggest sin is unforgiveness. The black community has never forgiven for the sin of slavery. Okay, they've never. And it, I believe, you know, what does the scripture say, Matthew 7? If you do not forgive, neither will your father in heaven forgive you. So I believe we're going to bow by that. Until we forgive, we won't really see black America for set free. Mm. And as far as the podcast, it's uh, freshblackcoffee.podbean.com. Freshblackcoffee.podbean.com. And it comes out once uh, a week. I'm doing it once a week. So I uh, thank you for, for letting me play that. There's a lot more that can be said about these these issues too, but I know in our in our show we try to give people enough so that they want a little more, so they can. I want to find out about Chicago since you're up there in Chicago too. Yeah, well, I mean we had the Chicago riot in 1919, so you know we need to talk about that at some point as well. But look, look, my friend, I appreciate your being on. Uh, I look forward to uh, to your book and your podcast, and eventually bringing you back on again. For Thank those who for those who are watching, we'll be back in just a moment.
Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Wallace, president and co-founder of Freedom's Journal Institute for the study of faith and public policy. And I'm here today to tell you about a project that we're really excited about. It's called Racism in America and the Role of the Church. We live in a time and day of conspiracy, a threat to the poor, a threat to the have-nots. We're doing this series because we believe that the black church needs to hear another voice. There's a voice out there that is secular. Society as well as the media are pushing the narrative that there's a resurgence in racism in America, especially with the rise of, of groups like Black Lives Matter and other protest groups. It's tearing the church apart. And I believe it's time for the, for the church in general, and the African American church in particular, to have a, a, another voice that has a different point of view, a biblical worldview. I'd ask you to prayerfully consider making a donation to this project. Thank you. Welcome back. It is now common knowledge that June 1st, 2021, marked the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa, Oklahoma riots of 1921. A new documentary, Tulsa Burning, the 1921 Race Massacre, has been released to remember this horrific event in the history of our great country. I write riots here because it used to be called a riot. However, it is now often referred to as a massacre. I don't know about you, but I'm suspicious of people who bring up black history these days with all the rewriting of history from the 1619th Project to the more recent push to teach critical race theory in our schools. Frankly, the social justice warriors make new documentaries suspect to me, especially since critical race theory in many cases lacks fundamental truths and facts. According to them, truth is subjective and narrative is more important than actual historical fact. That being said, I decided to watch another documentary first entitled Black Wall Street, full documentary, which happened to be another History Channel documentary included as part of the In Search of History series. The posted date on YouTube says July 13th, 2016. I don't know when it was filmed, but clearly it was before the obscuring of truth by many today. Therefore, I felt I might get a more honest telling of the Tulsa story. I then watched the newer documentary by the History Channel produced by Russell Westbrook. The basic story leading up to the riot was basically the same. The flourishing of Greenwood and the testimony of what black people can achieve even under challenging circumstances. The evidence that capitalism can work for black people when the laws of justice are equally applied. The doctors, lawyers, dentists, shoe salesmen, hotel and theater owners and more prove that even in 1920, some 57 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, black people were advancing in education, business, and industry. This was evident in both documentaries. Also evident was the inhumanity, racial hatred, death, and destruction described and depicted in each of the documentaries. The riot lit by the, by the match of falsehood concerning an alleged sexual assault on a white woman by a black man in an elevator would take the lives of men and women, black and white, and change the course of history for many. It was heartbreaking. The notable difference that emerged was that the older documentary accounted for 50 whites killed in the fighting. Another difference was that the older version mentioned that Greenwood, despite the riot and without help from the city or state, was rebuilt by the black residents who persevered to build their businesses, schools, churches, and homes. One of the main lessons we can take away from the tragedy is the resilience of the people who strove to obtain an education and build a thriving community for both themselves and their families. They would not be seen as victims, but as victors. The old documentary mentioned that the new Greenwood was more prosperous than the old Greenwood. A recent article entitled 100 Years, The Rebuilt of Black Wall Street said the same thing. The report stated that by 1925, Greenwood was rebuilt. The Greenwood Cultural Center noted that by 1942, that the district had, quote, 250 businesses exceeding the number of businesses before the massacre, end quote. This information is absent from the account given by the Black Lives Matter version of the documentary. For liberal progressives to have leverage, they must continue to paint black people as victims who are helpless to defend themselves or capable of rebuilding their communities. 
This became clear in the 2021 documentary seen at the radio station. They wrongly suggest that Black Wall Street never recovered. Then you have a lawyer who I guess represents the reparations case mentioning the same thing and showing the ruins of what was left of the once thriving hotel. The problem is the story they tell is simply not true. As noted earlier, Greenwood was rebuilt and continued to prosper until the 1960s when segregation was abolished and urban renewal, a government program, kicked in. The truth is the hotel was never rebuilt. However, that was only one business. The story of Black Wall Street is a story of black resilience and fortitude that is too often lacking in our communities today. We face a fraction of the racism that blacks faced in the early 20th century. Yet they became educated, started families and businesses, grabbing hold to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for themselves. They even took up arms when necessary to defend themselves from the imminent threat. When I look at Greenwood, I see heroes, not victims. Their story represents a group of proud black Americans, a generation after slavery, who overcame the racial hatred surrounding them. Rejected from white society, they determined to build their community, to live life on their own terms, to be fully free. Nothing would stop them, not even a riot that would destroy much of their community. So from the ashes, they rebuilt. Racism could not destroy their dreams, hopes, and aspirations. Conversely, in many respects, the new doc documentary ignores part of their story in an attempt to rewrite a new narrative, a false narrative that says nothing has changed since 1921, that all blacks are still victims of white supremacy. Case in point, the new narrative connects the 2016 police shooting of Terrence Crutcher to the, to the riot. Please read my article on our website to see the false parallel. However, this attempt does a disservice to the memory of those who lost their lives and those who survived the 1921 riot in Greenwood. The new documentary says it wants justice. I contend you can't ask for justice based on a lie. Lying is inherently unjust. The Bible says, quote, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, end quote. It's from Exodus 20, verse 16 and Deuteronomy 5, 20. Quote, you shall not spread a false report you shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit, siding with the many, so as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in a lawsuit. That's Exodus 23, verses 1 through 3. Unfortunately, this new documentary falls in the footsteps of Black Lives Matter, Critical Race Theory, and the 1619 Project with a narrative that bears false witness to an event that we should collectively remember and learn from, both the good and the bad. Ladies and gentlemen, we are kingdoms in conflict.